Hello, everyone, and welcome to our CSR Marketplace live session this afternoon. We are glad that you are here with us for the latest in impact measurement for KPIs for strategic corporate philanthropy with our partners and friends from True Impact. We're going to give everyone a minute to hop on to the session. We have lots of people registered this afternoon, so we'll give everybody a minute to get into the Zoom room before we jump into the content. As you are coming in, if you would pop over to the chat and just introduce yourself, um, it's really helpful for the speakers to know who's on the line with us. So if you'll just open the chat and enter your name, your company, where you're, where you're uh, dialing in from today, just to let us know who's on the line, that would be really helpful. So. Welcome to everyone. We are glad that you are here for this CSR Marketplace Live session on the latest in impact measurement. So the CSR Marketplace Live is a series of pre-conference sessions associated with our annual conference um, delivered by our partners in the CSR field. And we really appreciate True Impact being a part of this series of sessions and are looking forward to hearing from them today. We are using some of the features of Zoom. I know many of you are familiar, but we're just gonna go through the features that we're using today. The first is live transcript. If that accessibility feature is important to you, you have access to the subtitles. You can also go down to the bottom and click on the live transcript button and see a full transcript that will pop up on the side of your screen. If the subtitles are distracting, you can also turn them off from that same button at the bottom of your screen. Um, but if that is helpful to you, that feature is, is turned on today. Um, we will make a recording of the session available to everybody along with any associated uh, materials or follow-up resources. That information will be going out by the middle of next week. So you will get a recording of, of what you see here today. We are gonna be using the chat. Thank you for those of you that are already introducing yourselves. If you have not already, pop over to the chat and say hello and let the speakers know who you are and where you're joining from today. Um, I should say I'm Erica Bader, uh, Vice President of Content from for ACCP, and I'm joining from Orlando, Florida today. So um, not a very sunny day in Orlando, but certainly warmer than, than some of you. Um, so please feel free to inter introduce yourself and engage in the chat. We will be using the Q&A feature to take questions this afternoon. Um, at any point in time during the session, click on that Q&A box and you can add a question. We'll take them towards the end, but go ahead and add them at any point in time during the session. We're also using the upvote feature. So if you go over to the Q&A box and there's a question that you also would like answered, click that thumbs up. And if we have multiple questions, that just helps us prioritize um, which ones we, we give to the speakers. So um, as I mentioned, the CSR Marketplace Live events are part of the pre-conference series for our Corporate Citizenship Conference, which will take place in December. So we hope to see many of you back with us online here uh, December 7th through 9th. Um, so with that, I'd like to get us started today and introduce our speakers from True Impact. Sadie Miller and Sarah Ansel are gonna take us through the content and I will hand it off to Sadie and Sarah and let them jump right in. Thank you both. for. Hi, I'm Sadie Miller. I'm the Director of Client Success at True Impact. And this is my colleague. I think you can see her face, Sarah Ansel. I'm calling in from Western Massachusetts. Sarah, where are you? I'm in the middle of the country. I'm in Madison, Wisconsin today. All right, let me see if I can share my screen with you. All right, are you seeing the four KPIs of corporate philanthropy? The only metrics you need to strategically manage your programs, and keep your board happy. The true, uh, okay, let me move your beautiful faces. <laughs> okay, here we go. So True Impact is a software company and boutique consultancy firm focused entirely on social impact measurement. For nearly 16 years, we've supported Fortune 500 companies and foundations to measure their grants, matching gifts, volunteerism, and pro bono contributions. And I've been lucky to be here for 10 of those. Sarah and I help our clients organize and unify their investments around outcomes measurement so that they can direct resources to the most impactful partners and social causes. Today, 
we're discussing our approach to addressing the sector-wide challenge of translating grants, employee giving and service, advocacy, and in-kind support into community outcomes. So when we ask the question, what's the impact? We're also asking, what is the most important thing to measure? How do you compare a diversity of programs? What programs fit your company's goals? And how do you know if the data nonprofits are reporting is evidence-based? By the end of the presentation, you'll have a framework for what to measure, how to compare outcomes across programs, how to align investments with your priorities, and how to categorize data quality without throwing out promising new initiatives. But before we discuss our approach, I want to outline some of the pitfalls of traditional measurement tools. First, grants and volunteer management systems can provide great information about who you serve, how much you give, and where you give. But you can't pull results from program inputs and outputs. Second, you can get closer to outcomes with freeform impact reports. But pulling narrative outcomes and unstandardized metrics is possible, but rarely can outcomes be compared across your investment portfolio. And honestly, no one should have to clean and translate qualitative nonprofit narratives into the quantitative format that's needed for a final senior leadership deliverable. You just don't have the time for that. So your time should be spent on partnership development and impact investing, not kind of taking some of the wrong data and trying to make it into the impacts that are really needed. And then finally, Traditional program evaluation may be accessible for a few signature partnerships, but our interest is outcomes measurement for everybody. The high touch, complex, and expensive process of traditional program evaluation just doesn't help us get to scale. So over the next 30 minutes, we're going to walk you through four key performance indicators that can guide your impact investing and strengthen your reporting approach. Sarah, take it away. Sure, so let's break down those four key ways. First, we'll talk about how you can best capture impact. That is, how do you best track outcomes and not outputs? The second KPI we'll talk about is the return on investment and how to track the productivity of your investments. Then we'll talk about alignment and how to track the different ways your investments align or don't align with your priorities. And the fourth KPI we'll dig into is that data quality piece that Sadie mentioned. So we'll talk about how best to track the quality of the data behind the impacts. Let's dig into that first KPI. And this is moving from outputs to outcomes. So Social impact is defined as the ways in which people's lives are improved or contributions to society. And in our work, we often ask nonprofits, and then what? So you say you run a class uh, teaching 100 youth about nutrition, and then what? Oh, so those youth learn about cooking and growing food. Great. And then what? So then those youth eat more fruits and vegetables at home after their classes. That's, that's fantastic. And, and then what? Oh, and then their health is improved as a result of eating healthier over time. That is your social impact. So outcomes are the end result of the various input and outputs of a program. So we often break down the steps along the way to social impact into four key stages, reach, learn, act, and succeed. So reach is the stage in which people are engaged or receive services. So those youth enroll in that nutrition class. Learn is the stage in which people gain skills or motivation or knowledge. And that's where the kids learn about nutrition. 
And then act is the stage in which people do something with that learning. They change their behavior in some way. So that's the kids who go home and eat fruits and vegetables at dinner after taking your class. And then succeed is the stage in which people's lives are ultimately improved. And that's the kids who are made healthier as a result of all of that nutritious eating. So by breaking down each stage along the way, organizations can more clearly define the steps that get them to the ultimate impact of their program. And it helps differentiate those outputs from the ultimate outcomes. Once a partner's impacts are clearly defined, then you'll wanna consider how you begin to aggregate those impacts across your investments. It's important not to overclaim the impacts that your investments have generated and to develop a clear approach to calculating the percentage of those impacts that you can reasonably claim. This is a big question that a lot of funders grapple with. How do they approach that calculation of calculating their appropriate claim? So there are a couple of different ways to do this. One is the contribution claim. So the contribution claim represents the portion of a nonprofit's overall social impact that you can claim as a result of your investment based on the percentage of the budget that your investment supports. So you'll wanna use a contribution claim if the investment is direct services or maybe it's a capacity development initiative. The next approach to developing an approach to calculating claim is the attribution claim. So this is calculating the net improvement in successful outcomes that are a direct result of your investment. An attribution claim is typically applicable in cases where the grant or donation or volunteers increase the capacity of the nonprofit to serve more people or to become more effective in achieving its mission. So to get at that attribution claim, the nonprofit first must have an understanding of what their baseline of services looks like. Then they would determine the ultimate outcomes of their program, and then they would understand how many of those outcomes are attributable to your support. They would subtract the baseline outcomes from the post support or post project outcomes uh, to determine the net effect of your investment. And then there's a third way to calculate this. And the third way to calculate that, that claim is the catalyzed approach. So catalyzed impacts are social impact ripple effects that you can claim beyond those that you directly funded. So if you are a foundational funder, and what we mean by that is the program may not have been implemented without your support, you can make a contribution claim on the social impacts in proportion to the percent that you fund and a catalyzed claim on the rest of the impacts because you enabled the whole program to be implemented. Catalytic claims can also be, uh, be done on a foundational donation if your investment allowed for that program or model or resource to be replicated uh, and even replicated into the future. So you could reasonably claim three up to maybe five years of outcomes of a program that's been replicated based on the program that you originally funded. So once you've approached that claim and considered how you're going to calculate it, then you have a beautiful story to tell. So you can share with others the total amount of your funding, the funding invested into your social cause priorities, the number of people engaged or reached due to your investments, which is that key step along the way to social impacts, and then the number of people who experience those social impacts due to your impact and due to your investments, excuse me. And then you can also share a high level description of what those impacts are. So you can keep it high level such as food security or income or housing or school performance, and then map those impacts onto a geographic distribution of your partners or even the sustainable development goals. And a really compelling example of how to use impacts to communicate your work and to also increase and, and leverage other investments is, uh, is this one that I'm showing here. The PepsiCo public goal of having 100 million people gain safe water access by 2030. This has been a long commitment and one which they've shared publicly, which again has helped them leverage more funding for this critical need. 
So the second KPI, return on investment, takes the first KPI of impact that Sarah just explained. And with a simple calculation, enables you to understand what outcomes are driving the most social value. So if our goal in doing good is to do the most good with what we have, then we'll really need to focus on what's the return on investment of our, uh, of our work. So the reason that we calculate SROI or ROI, social return on investment, is so that we can determine how efficiently our investments are generating positive social outcomes. This is, uh, is different than sort of the business way if we think about ROI. But again, the, the priority here is how do we do the most good with what we have? To calculate ROI, take the total outcomes and then divide them by the total program cost. That cost includes direct overhead and in-kind costs of the program itself. Then by multiplying the number by 10,000, we get a kind of easy to use number that shows how much value each program creates per $10,000. So here we have 250 people housed divided by the cost of the program times 10,000 is 2.5 people housed per $10,000 invested. And the ROI calculation allows for a simple and powerful analysis to guide investments and identify best practices. However, this alone assumes comparability. In the example I show here, the education programs with the program with the greatest ROI provide supplies to students compared to the after school enrichment program, skill development, graduation, and career development program. The ROI alone would guide us to invest in the supply program. But we want to take a closer look at those impacts because here the five educational programs actually have three different kinds of of impacts. So we encourage the use of contextual ROI, comparing programs that have common outcomes and definitions of excess, success to each other. So the supplies program offers a lower impact solution compared to the higher impact graduation and career development program. And because both of these programs have the same type of high impact outcomes, what we do is we'd apply the SROI calculation to invest in the graduation program, which has the highest ROI. And here's an example from a measurement guide that we created for Impact 20, 2030 on how to measure the impact of volunteerism on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which uses several of the core principles that we've been discussing here. Across these partner education programs, the lowest ROI program is still a priority because its success of enabling young adults to gain an upwardly mobile career path just has the highest impact. So let's talk about that third KPI, which is alignment and how best to track the different ways your investments align or don't with your goals. So when you open the newspaper, and are faced with the many challenges that exist across the globe, it can be overwhelming to narrow down which issues or communities should be elevated and supported through your philanthropy. Often we find that projects or initiatives are supported due to existing relationships or internal priorities that aren't driven by strategic planning. So ensuring that your investments align with your goals through a thoughtful alignment strategy is a key step in managing your giving portfolio. So what is that alignment strategy? We recommend using three key questions, where, who, and what. So for example, you could consider organizing your investments by where they'll have an impact. You might consider different kinds of geographic distribution, including different markets or continents or countries or operating regions or sites and facilities. 
You could also organize around who will be impacted by focusing your investments on partnerships that engage and impact priority demographic uh, groups. And then another approach is to consider the what. So what cause area is most critical in your community? Aligning your investments by cause area could be achieved by focusing on a set of issues or perhaps intervention types or program types or the very specific impacts that you seek to generate. Alignment will allow you to review your investments and impacts by your selected alignment approach. And keep in mind, this is really similar to what Sadie just talked through in terms of organizing uh, your programs by like indicators, by like impacts. As you look at SROI, you can also do the same thing, but looking at alignment to various alignment strategies. So for example, uh, with this alignment strategy, you might prioritize program, excuse me, without this alignment strategy, you might prioritize program A and B due simply to the magnitude of their impacts. But when you layer on this alignment strategy, in this case, a geographic distribution approach based on different global markets, it's clear that program A and program D are most aligned with your goals. Or perhaps you'd like to review how your different partnerships impact children, so the who. By tracking impacts by different demographic groups, you can more easily identify partnerships that are not only contributing meaningful impacts, but are contributing meaningful impacts among your priority populations. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, one example of, an, of a company that's really using this alignment strategy well. So Dow developed a core set of pillars based on the type of impacts uh, that they seek to support, which is the what, and the location of their partnerships, which is the where. So Dow's global citizenship programs focus on advancing sustainable solutions, building inclusive communities, and developing tomorrow's innovators. And they also focus on supporting those goals within the communities in which they operate. So this alignment has allowed Dow to track the impact of their investments and roll up those investments along their local and global priorities or goals. And our fourth and final KPI is data quality, or how do you know if the data nonprofits are reporting is evidence-based? We categorize evidence very simply. First, speculation, logical assumptions, based on experience or expertise or just, you know, things you want to have happen, those are classified as not evidence-based. And then there's evidence-based data, which includes both tracking and estimations that are based on sampling, pilot surveys, previous results, and external studies. In order to make measurement accessible for your partners, we encourage you to count estimates as an important first step in the measurement journey of building measurement capacity for your partners. And that's why, again, we're putting in evidence-based other ways of knowing and understanding outcomes. So, Tracking data quality as a metric can be really valuable as a performance indicator to work to improve over time. Again, thinking about it as a measurement journey that's part of your partnership. And then data quality can influence immediate actions, like whether to invest, what, uh, what we call on the day-to-day, -day, the sniff test. All right, how, how does this really, this is a, how does this impact smelling to me when it comes to the, the evidence available. And it can drive engagement and improvement, um, give you the confidence to report to different stakeholders and celebrate successes. So we walked through all four of those KPIs and let's pull them all together and think about how those four KPIs will give you the information you need to make the most impactful investments in the issues and the communities that matter to you most. So a quick refresher of each of these. Impact, this is tracking outcomes, not outputs. ROI, this is reviewing the productivity of your investments through a return on investment calculation. Alignment, this is developing an alignment strategy based on those core questions, the where, the who, and the what. And then data quality, this is tracking data quality and ensuring that the data behind your impacts is considered high quality.
All right. So we're going to put it all together in one imaginary Excel spreadsheet. But this is really the, the spreadsheet that I, or the piece of paper, the series of post-it notes that we hope that you, you know, you bring home with you and, uh, and put in column A, all of your programs organized by the, those priorities. Here we have it as market one and two, but it could be uh, a little bit more information about that, that alignment component. The impacts, so really write down what are the outcomes that you really care about for each one of these programs and what's the magnitude of those impacts. Do you have high quality data for those and for some of the other key alignment issues? Are they ticking the boxes for uh, your, you know, your demographic, your, your what, um, your where, um, or your who, who, what, where, right? Who, what, right. where, <laughs> your who, what, where alignment. <laughs> and then from that, you're gonna make some decisions. Where are we going to put next year's investments? Where do we need to just pick up the phone? We're not saying that there's a yes or no that you know you sort of throw all of these promising practices away, but they, they haven't quite gotten there yet. Sometimes this is about not managing investment, but managing the partnership itself so that you can move, you know, um, that, that partnership forward. And then how do you promote some? How do you encourage more investment? Um, I had a, a, just a fantastic call um, a few weeks ago with a funder that said, you know, we want to, we want to build a fire for you know, for our partnerships, we want to invite people to come around and to warm their hands and to to be part of the kind of um, the impact that we're generating here. And that's what promotion is all about. So we wanted to share with you all today strategies that anyone can employ uh, in your work. Um, but we also want to point out that we can make this easier, um, all four of these steps. So at True Impact, we work with nonprofits every day to create their social impact report. And through this process, we help them develop their theory of change. Uh, we help them track their full impacts using standardized validated indicators. And then we help substantiate their impact data and make transparent the quality of the data behind their reports. Uh, we feature success stories in what we do, and we provide hands-on technical assistance to all nonprofits throughout this process. And I don't think I'm going out on a limb if I say that that is the work that Sadie and I probably hold dearest, um, is working with these amazing partners to help them tell their story. Uh, each social impact report is available to the funders who've requested them, of course, but it's also the nonprofits. It's the nonprofits to keep and to share and to use as a communication tool. Then once all of those social impact reports are pulled together, we then get to share back with you, the funder, about what does this, uh, these stories look like in aggregate. So your funder data dashboard would feature your, a breakdown of your investments, impacts, geographic distribution, the types of different people, beneficiaries impacted by, this, by your support, your social return on investment, sustainable development goals, and much more. So your data dashboard is entirely live and it updates regularly anytime your nonprofit partners go in and warm their hands, as Sadie said, and continue to update those reports to really amplify their stories. So at True Impact, we strive to make measurement easy, giving you more time to strengthen your partnerships, to elevate those partnerships, and to share your story of impact with others. Uh, so don't hesitate to reach out to us with questions. We have plenty of time to, I, I see some questions popping up, so I'm excited to hear more from those. And I also just want to quickly call out Erica and Hillary at ACCP. You guys have made this very easy. So thank you so much for all of your work and allowing me and Sadie to talk about the things we care most about rather than trying to figure out what button to click on. So thank you. <laughs> no, thank you all for being here. And we do have a lot of questions. So we're going to see how many we can get to in the next 15 minutes. 
Um, mm -hmm. The first one is, what are the best practices to calculating the total cost of a program to be able to know what to put in that ROI calculation? Uh, so, um, you know, oftentimes we, um, we will ask a nonprofit organization if this is a general operating grant that's supporting uh, many programs, uh, then this would be their, their total annual budget. Um, if it is a single program that's you know, easy for them to, um, to sort of break out from that, then the cost of the program plus any overhead to support it. And then for um, <laughs> big messy stuff, like let's say um, supporting a, um, a public education program, uh, so embedded within a school district, then um, again, you know, we, we do take a really open arms approach to how close, how good can we get, um, but still inviting everyone to the table. And the table in those cases is, so what's the, what's the per pupil cost? How close can we get to, to knowing about how much it costs per your, your reach, your participation? And, um, you know, I, I would say we take a pretty flexible approach because we are going to be serving those different partners differently. Sarah, anything to add? I will just add that often uh, when I work with nonprofits to develop the overall cost of their program, sometimes there, there's a feeling of being overwhelmed. And usually it, it becomes clearer when I ask the question, well, you say that 200 students graduate on time as a result of that work that you're doing. Well, how, what does that cost? So don't think about all of the uh, building blocks of your program. Let's look at it holistically and think about what is what are all of the ingredients that have to come together to help those 200 students graduate on time. Um, and it kind of clarifies what number we're really looking for, which is that, that cumulative cost to achieve those outcomes. And then that ensures the ability to analyze that ROI uh, more accurately. Got it. Um, so Stephanie had a question. It might be difficult to justify going after the lowest monetary ROI, even though it creates the highest impact ROI. So can you share some communication strategies about how to advocate for going for that program with the higher impact, but maybe the lower ROI? Sarah, you want to take it? Sure. Alignment, alignment, alignment. That's what comes oh, yeah. to mind for me. Yep. So being able to message clearly that this partnership is so valuable because it checks the boxes for our priorities when it comes to the communities that we care most about or the populations that we care most about or giving an opportunity to contextualize what those impacts look like. Yes, graduate on time, let's use that example again. And it's not 200, it's 20, but it's 20 students that are hardest to reach. It's 20 students that have struggled um, in ways that you know somebody who's just looking at the numbers may not fully appreciate. Uh, so I think it's always about the alignment piece and coming back to what your priorities are. What would you say, Sadie? Uh, I, I couldn't say more, but if there is a chance for me to talk about um, uh, a, a really incredible program that works to um, with um, people who are just getting out of jail to um, train them in, uh, in automotive repair. And at the end of that intensive year, they have a, um, a certificate that's gonna get them to a six-figure job and, uh, and a 0% recidivism rate. Are you kidding me? Yeah, low so social ROI, the best story you could tell. Great. Apparently there's more to say on this. Sorry, Eric. I just want <laughs> no, to add go one, ahead. one more thing, which is to consider breadth versus depth, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes the magnitude of a program might look pretty impressive, but when you think about uh, how deep that impact is, and this is I'm maybe amplifying what Sadie has shared, you know, how long lasting is that impact? And sometimes going deep with a smaller group um, might mean more over the long term than a lighter, lighter impact touching more people. Yep, that makes sense. Um, so sort of related, how do you measure or define or decide what is high impact? Hmm. Uh, I could go back to, to reach, learn, act, and succeed. 
Um, so we walk through a process and, um, and we really help define the difference between um, those, did I, oh, now you have to keep going. Yeah, uh, it, it's re we're going to begin at the beginning here. Um, it, is that we um, we don't let learn be succeed, act be succeed, reach be succeed by asking, uh, as Sarah said so beautifully. So what happens next? And by having that kind of five question approach, we are also helping winnow down and separate the difference between lower impact or outputs um, and uh, richer or deeper and more lasting change. Um, can you use this same approach to showcase business benefits as well? I know there's a lot of conversation in our membership around the impact of programming on employee, you know, employee experience or employee engagement, for example, um, or is this primarily focused on, on social impact? We use this primarily for social impact. So there are some other components of the, the sort of business or employee benefits of this kind of work, um, skill development, uh, colleague relationship development can be really powerful. Um, but part of that is, you know, employees sense of connection and relationship development with community members and nonprofit organizations. Um, this in and of itself really is about getting to the community based outcomes. So. Okay. Good. Um, so if you aren't able to access high quality data, does it invalidate the rest of your reporting? Can I take this one? You look ready, Sarah. The answer is no. And I feel so strongly about this um, because, um, because of the second question, which is um, investing in programs that are, are smaller, that are grassroots, often means that um, they may not have uh, the infrastructure in place to do high quality, uh, systematic, surveys of participants. And that does not mean that that partnership is not worthwhile and worthy. It does mean though, that in my opinion, that, that making apparent the gap in the data quality is an, a perfect opportunity for that, that pick up the phone icon that was in Sadie's putting it all together section and saying, gosh, this is a program that it hits all of our priorities and we see the importance of your impacts. And we also see that you're using a lot of speculation here and how can we connect you to the right research or the right capacity development opportunities to drive up that data quality. Um, so I also ran for many years a very innovative program. There was no research to draw from. I, I There was nothing out there that I could say, this, this is why you should believe our impact. Ultimately, we were able to conduct a study and show that impact. But for years, I had funders that uh, took the leap of faith with us and it was well worth their investment. So I think the key is to make transparent that gap in data quality and then connect the dots or help support connect the dots to opportunities to strengthen that data quality. Sadie, what would you say? You're amazing. <laughs> Um, and I think that that does relate to this last question. So I'll ask it and just see if there's anything else you want to add about how do you use the method with grassroots and smaller nonprofits? I mean, one of the things that we know after um, George Floyd's murder and the whole the whole focus on racial equity is that there was a real focus on smaller grassroots nonprofits organizations that don't necessarily have that infrastructure. Um, so, you know, Sarah, you talked a lot about recognizing that and then finding ways to support them, but is there anything else you would add about working with smaller organizations? So when we say four KPIs, we're serious about that. You have to stop measuring other things. Like we picked four and, and, uh, and we're often on the phone saying, okay, so take this out. So you don't need to measure that. If, if you're budget can just be three lines. We want to have it just be three lines. And we don't care about like the names and roles of your board members. That is not our, our key here. 
our, our key is, are you producing the, the outcomes that are, are really helping you fulfill your mission? How can we support and elevate and show that you're doing that? Because that's, you know, that's what we're here for. Um, and, and so a lot of this is, is actually pulling away other pieces of, um, of what sort of common or traditional reporting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the premise of our work is to make measurement more accessible and easier uh, for everyone involved. Uh, because there are such important programs out there that deserve to be elevated and deserve to be funded. And uh, if we can help amplify that story through the reporting process and then funders in turn can recognize it support it and share it with others i think we've done done the best job we can do great well we don't have any more questions thank you so much for for um answering the ones that we did have there's some great information in the chat and we'll make sure that that is added to the resources that are sent to everyone um, by the middle of next week together with the recording and the transcript from today so if you weren't able to grab all of those um, links we'll make sure that we include those as well um, sadie and sarah's information is here on the screen so if you want to connect with them directly please do i want to thank all the participants for being on the line and for your good questions and uh, and your engagement in the chat and Sadie and Sarah and the True Impact team, thank you so much for um, your time and your um, talent and expertise today. It was a really um, engaging conversation and and interesting to think about how to make measurement easy. We don't often hear those two words in the same <laughs> sentence. Um, so we appreciate you sharing the True Impact approach and, and helping us learn about what you do. So thank you for supporting our CSR Marketplace Live and for being with us this afternoon. Um, we're gonna pop a survey into the chat. So for our attendees, if you would take a minute to fill that out, that's just helpful for, for all of us to get the feedback on the session. So if you would, find the time to do that. And then, um, as I said, you'll have uh, the follow-up resources um, next week. So Sadie and Sarah, thank you again. And thanks to everyone else for being on the line today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.